public policy and to the Bukatima campus and to this public lecture. Uh, the first order of business that I've been told today is for me to extend the apologies of the Dean, uh, Dean Kishore Muhubani, who would have been here but for his trip to Shanghai, so I'm um, extending his very warm regrets. In his place, you have me, somebody altogether far younger and better looking, so hopefully <laughs> that's not too disappointing. The Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy reserves public lectures for its most uh, distinguished and accomplished guests, and today we're extremely fortunate uh, to have one of the most preeminent scholars, activists, and environmentalists to, to uh, deliver today's lecture, Dr. Ashok Kolsler. Dr. Kolsler is one of the world's leading experts on the environment and sustainable development. Born in Kashmir in 1940, he gained his master's degree from the University of uh, Cambridge before going to do his doctoral studies of Harvard. At Harvard, he was part of the team that designed and taught Harvard's first ever undergraduate course on the environment, famously inspiring Al Gore, the former US Vice President, who, as we all know, has become one of the great champions of the environment. After spending some years in the United States, he returned home to his native India, where he became the founding director of the Indian government's Office of Environmental Planning and Coordination, the first such agency of any developing country in the world. In 1976, he was appointed the director of the United Nations Environment Program, where he designed and launched in InfoTerra, uh, the global environmental information exchange system. He remained with the UN Environment Programme until 1982 when he left to found Development Alternatives, a Delhi-based non-governmental organisation devoted to delivering commercially viable and economically, uh, and, sorry, environmentally friendly technologies. He's also been a board member of numerous global environmental organisations including the Club of Rome and the World Conservation Union and the International Institute for Sustainable Development. He's also served, among others, to, as an advisor to the World Bank, the United Nations Development Programme and to the Indian Government. I could go on and on and on, but in the interest of the environment, I didn't print out your extremely long resume. Uh, so please, ladies and gentlemen, join me in welcoming to the podium Dr. Colson. Thank you, Daryl. Um, I, um, I thought it would be useful, since there are so many people who think, uh, eat, and sleep business in this wonderful country, to share with you where I think business is going, where it's headed. And it's headed in that direction partly because of external factors, factors that are uh, bigger than uh, uh, any of us, bigger than business, uh, and partly because I think the world of tomorrow is going to be very different from the world of today. So I'm going to take you through a series of thought processes which may be somewhat um, unfamiliar and certainly in some cases rather uncomfortable, but that's my job and I have to do it, so you'll have to bear with me. Uh, I'd like to basically give you a quick overview of the context in which business operates today and will be operating in the future and then uh, look at um, the issues of sustainability that um, they will have to address uh, in some measure more and more as time goes on. And then look at what are the opportunities for businesses? How do they remain in the marketplace and redesign their business models, their uh, products and services, their ways of operating, their supply and delivery systems uh, to be able to stay ahead of the circumstances that are going to overtake them if they're not careful. And that's the kind of thing that I call the business of the future. Um, let me start with the global context. You are familiar with the next few issues that I'll talk about, but it's always good to have a, a common base. And I just start by telling you that I think one of the biggest challenges facing humankind in history ever uh, is the issue of climate change. Uh, over the last 25 years of the previous century up to the year 2000, this map, this pockmarked map, shows you with the size of the red circles the amount of temperature rise there has been just in those 25 years. 
The bigger circles are really about one degree centigrade uh, rise in temperature. Smaller ones can be down to 0 0.2, 0 0.4. But you can see that the world is heading for warmth. Uh, and this is the kind of result that will happen. Sea level rise, floods, forest fires, droughts, vector-borne diseases. This is a map of a model that was done to show that dengue, which is kind of nice, kind, quite a nice, nasty disease, is going to increase several fold uh, if temperature rises continue. And then there are other things which are almost as bad. I mean, climate change is bad enough, but loss of species. Can you imagine what we would do if you lost the rosy periwinkle you see up there, and we're about to lose it? It's now confined to a few hectares in Madagascar. But that is the major, in fact, the only sole source of cure for childhood leukemia. So if, uh, if you have childhood cancer and you don't have this, we don't at the moment have a solution. Uh, we've got all kinds of other problems coming up. Oil and gas, today and this morning in the interview on Bloomberg, I had to answer this question. Do I believe in oil peak? Yeah, it's already happened. There isn't going to ever be a year again from today where we'll have more oil produced than we have uh, right now. In fact, it's going to go down. And it's going to go down more and more steeply. And in another 30, 40 years, you'll have to think of something else. Uh, we've got desertification. Um, the deserts are growing around the world at about 60,000 uh, square kilometers. One or two of my slides have Indian numbers. You'll have to forgive me. I did have a ch chance to change them. This one is um, 15,000 square kilometers in India alone. And around the world, approximately 60. Uh, rapid destruction of our forests, uh, increasing water stresses and scarcities. Uh, these are real issues, and the growth of population is like a hockey stick, just exploding. For thousands of years, we were more or less level at a few hundred million, and in the last century, we've shot up essentially from one billion to six billion. So the world has encountered a period of discontinuity, of change, rapid change, that it's never had to deal with ever before. I'm not here to tell you doomsday stories. That's not my business. I believe that we're going to survive and, and, and flourish, but we can only do so if we take action. We can't survive or flourish if we continue business as usual. So my message really is about how each one of us in this room and outside are going to have to take responsibility for bringing about the changes needed. Uh, there you have it. Um, the end of uh, the story isn't even known yet, but I can tell you I work in the, a lot in the center of India in a, in a state called Madhya Pradesh, central India, and uh, in one district where I have my, about 100 of my colleagues have got very special large-scale programs of water, livelihood creation, jobs, industries of various types, low-cost construction, and so on. We work there uh, very intensively. And in the last, uh, the total population of that district was about 1.2 million people. Uh, in the last three, four years, 600,000, 650,000, more than 50% of those people that to migrate because there's no water. You go into this district and you see door after door, house after house, locked, blockaded by what do you call that stuff, tumbleweed or whatever, and the whole population has migrated out, this population. And it's happening not just in India, but in a lot of places. Droughts and floods and tsunamis and, and many other things, most of them caused by human uh, causes, interventions, uh, sometimes nature adding to them. But for the 50% uh, in, in India, well, in India it's about 25%, 50% of the world, uh, life is pretty good. Thank you. you know, shopping malls and 
this is a shopping mall from my city, Delhi. Uh, houses, cars. Um, let me show you something interesting. I wonder if anybody can guess what that is. That is a six-story garage. A six-story garage which belongs to a 27-story house. This house has um, <clears throat> three helipads on top. It's actually 54 stories high because each story is double, double height. So um, it's, it's a nice place to live. Uh, garage, servants' quarters, guest suites, ballrooms, one house, one family. It's a house, as I say, with a garage. That's the first house in the world, according to Forbes magazine, that costs $2 billion. Nice bathrooms. A elevator bank of eight, eight elevators. You're never going to have to wait. Um, it's a good place. Now, the, the lady of the house who lives up there, she looks out of the window, and this is what she sees. <coughs> there is a disjoint here. Now, we may laugh because this is the most extreme case I've ever come across, but we're all living these lives in some way or another. This is what the world is about. This world is so topsy-turvy that we are essentially heading for collective suicide. The very people who live like that don't realize it, but if not in their own lifetimes, and I suspect it's going to be very, very soon, certainly in the lifetimes of their children, are going to pay the cost of being so insensitive and so ignorant about what goes on around them. So it's important for us to look at the other half. In India, it would be 75%. They live like this. That family, that picture, has the entire net assets, net worth, of this family right in the picture. These women, typical of about 400 million women, uh, in my country alone, maybe 1.5 billion women around the world, walk two, three, four hours a day collecting clean water to drink. 1.3 billion people, people in the world, mostly women, uh, have to do that uh, every day. And that's what it looks like in many of these villages. And then they spend another three or four hours collecting fuel wood. And then another two or three hours cooking with that fuel wood. Now there's a number over there which says 400,000, and I'd like to tell you a little bit about it. That's the number, according to WHO, of women who die prematurely every year because of indoor air pollution from that cooking. 1.5 million people, women, children, particularly girls, die every year around the world because of the gunk that comes out of those cook stoves. Uh, not only does she spend four or five hours collecting that fuel, she's going to die 15, 20 years earlier than she should have by breathing the stuff that comes out of it. And she has no, forget it, forget electricity, she has no commercial energy source at all. Talk about coal or gas or kerosene, forget it. And that's two billion people out there who have no toilets. And there's, um, you know, five million stunted babies born in my country every year. One third of the kids. And there are large numbers of people who can't read or write. And as a consequence of that, and partly as a result of that, you have what I call the champagne glass theory of life. That is the diagram on the cover of the UNDP Human Development Report on the income distribution in the world, and it happens to be pretty close to what it is in each of our countries. The top 20 percent 
get 85, 90, 100, almost 100 percent of the income in some countries. The bottom 50 percent get the crumbs, 6, 7, 8 percent. The difference, the ratio between the top 20 and the bottom 20 is sort of of the order of 100 already. It's a very, very unequal world, and we have to look at the consequences of that. And one of the consequences that is um, now beginning to be apparent is the damage it does to our resource base, to our ecosystem, to our forests, to our lands, to our waters and rivers. And it's a way of expressing that is the footprint, the ecological footprint. Many of you must know that. But the ecological footprint is a nice, convenient way of explaining what it is that we are doing to our world. It's simply the ratio, in a sense, of how much we use divided by how much is produced sustainably on the land in our economy. Uh, for a country, for the world, you can measure the total production and the total ability to produce of that resource base. So uh, I will show you some, some charts. And I, the ecological footprint of the world today is rated at about 1.3, 130%. In other words, we are using 30% more each year than the world actually produces on a sustainable basis. We're drawing down what bankers would call our capital, our natural capital. And this 30% means that day before yesterday, on September the 24th, I think it was, we'd actually used up all the resources that are going to be produced in the year 2008. Now we are into uh, overshoot. We're into drawing down capital for the rest of the year. So we basically have to give a little thought to what that means. And you know, as a consequence of this, everything is just exponentially growing. Carbon dioxide concentrations in the atmosphere, hockey stick. Nitrous oxide concentrations, hockey stick. Methane, sulfates, hockey sticks. You look at anything. You look at the average surface temperatures, hockey sticks. Climate disasters, hockey sticks. Coastal shrimp farms, hockey sticks. Loss of global diversity, hockey sticks. Loss of forests, hockey sticks. Population, hockey sticks. Water use, hockey sticks. Fertilizers, hockey sticks. McDonald's restaurants, hockey sticks. <laughs> Motor vehicles, hockey sticks. Tourism, telephones, everything. Literally in the last 30, 40 years, we've exploded on the scene. The planet is going to have to do something to survive, and the planet means us. And there are new economies coming up, according to Goldman Sachs, if you still believe them. Uh, you've got, <coughs> I mean, you know, these are masters of the universe. You've got to believe them, right? Um, the uh, new economies, India, China, and so on, are going to be overtaken by the year 2030, 2050. These uh, traditionally uh, important economies of U.S., Japan, Germany, and so on. And what happens then? I mean, let's face it. Mother Earth can only handle so much. So let's have a look at business and its environment. Cities, runaway consumption, roads. Whoops, what happened to that? Roads and uh, energy all uh, in high gear. Raw materials. Mountains of wastes and toxics, huge pressures on the environment. And you know, it's all in the name of efficiency, the marketplace. You go out there, you set up a factory, you make your goods and products and widgets or whatever, you can sell large quantities of them. And they're cheap because you're throwing all your gunk into the surroundings. Somebody else is paying the cost for all your pollution, for all your waste. And so it's easy to, to be efficient. And that's exactly what you do. According to the World Bank, sorry, I left that slide out. According to the World Bank in China, there's another half a million people, and in India too, who are dying from outdoor air pollution, apart from those women in the kitchen, because of industrial pollution. And then you have efficiency in agriculture. You're going around pesticides, fertilizers, chemicals, everything else poisoning the countryside. 
and you're dumping it into your streams and lakes and rivers. And you're, in the name of efficiency, mining the countryside again. And, you know, this poor woman, she's from Tamil Nadu. You can see the number, license plate there from uh, around Madras, Chennai in India. She had a big family. She was advised by all the commercial people who come to advise her to use lots of fertilizer and lots of pesticides and a lot of this and that. And in seven, six or seven years, she'd killed her farm. She can't grow anything there anymore. And what was really the sole source of support for a family of seven or eight kids, husband, etc., she's now completely without uh, any source of income. So we live on limited resources, and we've got to understand that there are constraints that we have to uh, deal with. And the uh, issues are that uh, we live in a world, this woman in an Indian village has virtually nothing. All that she owns is virtually in this picture. She does have a television, and she does see bold and beautiful, and she does have a quick look at how other people live around the world. And at some point, this affects her thinking about what is a good life, what sort of aspirations she has are now determined by a global media system, just like the global economy, and there is no way to fulfill them. And then you worry about alienation and, and, and terrorism. I mean, what would you expect? We've got to go into the future with a different mindset. The bottom line is not enough. The bottom line of profits is not going to get us there. You have to have other bottom lines as well on the impacts of your activity on society, the impacts of your activity on nature, and unless you take these three or four things that are really uh, going to end up by being the major constraints on what we do, you're going to end up by losing the very, go the very, very uh, things that you set out to achieve. That income distribution is not going to work. It's, it's the wrong way to go. Uh, this is not to say that everybody has to have the same amount. Nobody's claiming that. But extremes of, um, of wealth and income uh, are logically contradict, well, uh, counter, countervailing to uh, the interests of the, of the environment. The rich tend to overutilize certain kinds of resources. We call them non-renewable resources, fossil fuels, minerals, metals, and all the other stuff. And the poor tend to overutilize the other kinds of resources. We used to call them renewable, but they're not renewable anymore. If you overutilize the soils and waters and destroy the forests, it takes a long time to bring them back. They essentially become non-renewable. So whether you have extreme wealth and affluence, we might call it a disease, affluenza, uh, you've got a real problem because you, that, that disease really essentially destroys uh, the, the um, medicine that, that you need in order to cure it. And at the other end, you have povertitis, a disease that's even worse because it ends up by destroying all the things that half the population, maybe more, uh, in fact, almost all the population, as, as I was saying at INSEAD because I gave a presentation on the services that ecosystems provide to, uh, to the world, to the, to the economy, which are so great that they are more than actually the physical economic output. The GDP of the world, which is now what, 60 trillion or whatever, is less than what nature is providing us in terms of hard cash value. So we've got to look at the issue in terms of our own self-interest. We want to survive then it is important to make sure that there are no people who are left completely out so that they don't end up. And this has led us to a whole new science about studying about the issue of how materials and energy and other things. And I was involved with a group of people about 15 years ago. We set up a club called the Factor of 10 Club because we came to the conclusion that unless we lowered the amount of material use in the world today by a factor of 10, there was no real way to uh, satisfy the ecological, basic ecological conditions of survival. And this 
diagram shows you that if you want that much sand, you're actually, the gray part, you're actually having to move that much sand. Now, with sand or stone and so on, it's not, it may be one to one or whatever. But when you get down to more uh, higher level uh, materials, it can become quite large. That rucksack has to be included because uh, today, around the world, if you leave out the ocean currents, if you leave out, leave out the flows of, of, of oceans, uh, the amount of material that is physically being moved by human beings to make roads, buildings, uh, airports, and whatever else, ships, is more than nature is moving. We've already, anthropogenic movement of material has already exceeded how much nature, ge geological processes move. So this is extremely disruptive. It, it, it affects your biogeochemical cycles, your water flows, and lots of other things. And uh, here's, here's a, an example. This is a ring, a gold ring. How much would you guess it weighs? 20 grams? Okay. It weighs 20 grams according to you, but according to me, it weighs 20 tons, because that's the rucksack which goes with it. Now, that little ring of yours has caused a massive disruption uh, of the ecosystem in South Africa, in wherever, uh, that gold was processed. You gotta think about it. You gotta think about the fact that um, this bottle, which is really very nice, I mean, it's got LKY on it and everything else, but the <laughs> fact of the matter is that making that bottle used up 10 times as much water as is in it. That's something you've got to think about. Um, and this is having an impact. Some of you may have heard that there have been food riots over the last few months. A couple of prime ministers have lost their jobs. That in Haiti, mothers are feeding their babies with mud cakes because they don't have enough food just to fill up their stomachs. We're talking about a world that's a little bit out of whack. You know, it doesn't make sense that in the year 2008, babies should be fed mud to keep them from crying of hunger. And it's happening around the world. Uh, so we've got to now look. This is a diagram which I believe uh, is representative of the kinds of things we've got to do. Uh, you've got to have the industrialized countries reduce their dependence on materials, we call it dematerialization. And, and to some extent, it's happening. I mean, cell phones and iPods, these are major lead dematerialization. But we still, you know, if, you know, if you're into a Hummer or you know, big SUVs and things, it's going to take a while. Now, as you come down that tail, um, things get better and better, of course. But in the poor countries, they're using too little. And the reason for that too little, uh, you might say it can never be too little, but it is, because as long as their lives are really deprived, one of the ways they get fulfillment and one of the ways they get security in life, etc., is to have babies. And the more babies they have, the more population there is, the more disruption of your ecosystem you're going to have as time unfolds. So in order to bring about the demographic transition, uh, I don't have to convince anybody in Singapore that better life leads to fewer babies. You know, I mean, even the government understands that. <laughs> They'll pay you to get married in this country. I mean, wow. Uh, but the same reasoning applies the other way. If you're having too many kids, you've got to improve your lives and then it turns out that you have fewer kids. It's happened throughout history. So in order to do that, you've got probably to use more energy and more materials for a while, but then they will also have to come down. In the end, they all have to be down at about one-tenth of what we're doing today. You can do that by things like miniaturization. An even better way is by increasing the longevity, the durability of your products, and an even better way is to share underutilized resources. 
to have a shower together or whatever. I mean, the point is that you will save a large amount if you were to tell the government, your office is a thing, they're doing nothing for about, what, 18 hours a day? Why don't we use them for something else? Why don't we put the kids in there for schools or whatever? So in a way that we've got to think much more creatively about the way we use our resources. So now I'm, I'm coming to the, the punchlines, which is what does it mean for us as businesses? I'm a businessman. You're, a lot of you are business people. And we've got to think about where we're going. If we're not allowed to have big factories which spew out large amounts of pollution, if we're not allowed to make products that are toxic and whatever else, sooner or later you're going to have problems with cell phones because each cell phone in your pocket, when you throw it away after six months because the new models come out, it's enough toxic waste in there to kill five horses. Now, you know, there are only so many horses around in the world, so how is it going to be used up? It's going to end up in your systems. So the fact is that we've got to actually think about the ramifications of all we do. So I think the business of the future is going to be the business that brings people, planet, and profits together. And it does so by working to make money, no question about it. But it also does other things. I call it business as unusual. We're talking about a whole new kind of business. And it's a business that's unusual because it's also working for a sustainable future. Not out of altruism, out of self-interest. And we've got to now have a slightly different mindset to understand how that self-interest is going to be um, brought about. Uh, investors are not going to put money into something that they're not going to get returns from. So we've done some analysis and we look at uh, the pyramid around the world of the different numbers of people who have different purchasing power or whatever. And you've got all these things, A, B, C, D, E, F. And uh, as you get down, lower and lower incomes, you get bigger and bigger. That's why it's a pyramid. Uh, this is where traditionally uh, investors like to invest, the top end, A and maybe B and maybe C. And um, that's where the bulk of our investment is going. And that's why you have that champagne glass, by the way. It's all related. Everything is cyclic. Now, I don't expect you to read this, but we did an analysis of the different kinds of investors who are interested in different parts of the pyramid. So at the very top, you can get high returns on investment, but they're high. you can bring in investors who are willing to take high risks. They involve major breakthroughs, big technology, large scale, this and that. And as you go down the pyramid, you get to D, where the returns to society, the returns to the environment are comparable to the returns, cash returns to the investor. And that's when things start being interesting because in the past, the investor was only interested in how much cash do I get back? Now we have gotta be aware that the world isn't going to support his, his or her business unless it's also there to support it. There are people with purchasing power. You know, the markets are drying up because We've saturated a large part of it. That's why you have to bring in new bags, new models, new everything every day. And uh, you can, you know, you can uh, fool some of the people some of the time, but you know, you can't go on fooling them forever. So sooner or later, those markets are going to dry up. And as you go further down, you start getting higher uh, returns at the at the social end, and maybe you're trading off a little bit of your cash returns. And so. The trick really is how do we get investors to start investing lower down in this pyramid and feel that they're getting what they wanted to get, which is uh, partly good returns and partly um, something they can talk about at the cocktail party, something they can feel good about, they can uh, um, you know, tell their children that we did something useful, etc. And we have to look at this in a bigger way. Uh, Peter Drucker once said, the social responsibility of a corporation, of a company, is to make money. And you know, I think he was right. I give him a big tick mark for that. Uh, he would have got an A in my class. <laughs> but I, he would have got an A also for his second saying, which is that every business professional should take the Hippocratic Oath to do no 
He didn't get as far as saying they should do good. That's, uh, you know, maybe asking too much of businessmen, but at least not to do harm. Well, now the world has come to the stage where we're expecting businessmen to do good as well. And we've got to now change our uh, perspectives, our premises about what business is. Uh, <clears throat> and um, this is out of sequence, but anyway. This, one of the ways to do this is what is now called social enterprise. Social enterprises have now become quite well known because uh, Davos talks a lot about them. Klaus Schwab has a prize, one of which we, we, my organization got for outstanding social enterprise. And the idea is that a social enterprise is a business that does what governments and voluntary organizations normally do, which is what is called development, but as a business, as a profit-making or at least non-loss-making uh, uh, business. Uh, mine, Development Alternatives in India, was actually probably the very first one way back. And I quoted Peter Drucker because when I was starting out 30 years ago, I went to him and I said, look, you know, I'm, I want to do something that's different and I want to bring about a total change in the business model where we can do what is called development in the marketplace. He said, no, 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 it's not possible. Nobody does that. Nobody is going to, it's, it's too much of a conflict between the objectives, social objectives and, and, the, and the financial objectives. You either do be a volunteer, do nonprofit, or you do business. And if you really want to be both, then you first make a lot of money and then you do that. But you can't do the two together. And I said, look, you know, it's in my DNA. I have no choice. I have to do it. And I set out to do it, and I'm not sure whether he was right or I was, but in another year or two, I hope to prove that he was wrong. Because basically, it is possible to do the right thing the right way and still make some money. Now, you're not going to become a Bill Gates doing it, maybe, but you are going to have a decent uh, life and, and uh, ability to, to make a difference. What characterizes social enterprises? It's usually focused on equity issues, rights of uh, all people, of all creatures, uh, environmental commitment, long, longer time horizons than businesses usually have, and certainly than governments usually have. Sustainability is very important for them. How does this uh, impact uh, the lives of people in the future? Uh, it's often people who are early adopters, early champions uh, of new things. And it involves a certain amount of uh, give and take, voluntary this and that, for trade-offs between business things. And, but they do have limitations. You know, the funding is very difficult. You can't, how do you raise finance if you can't provide the venture capitalist with his 30, 40, 100% returns? Uh, it's hard to get people at the kinds of salaries that you pay when you're not really highly profitable, when you don't have big margins. Uh, the scale of operations is therefore hard to achieve unless you can raise the finance that you need. Uh, it's very difficult uh, to influence uh, policy because you're small and not visible. Uh, it's easy for the head of Halliburton or Shell or whatever to go to the president of the U.S. and say, increase the prices of oil. He'd just do it. He's saluted in the process. But a social enterprise can't. Uh, access to support, marketing, branding, technical, this and that. So it's, it's tough. It's not, it's not easy. And I just thought I'd, you know, give you my analysis of how companies and how entrepreneurs look at it. Um, you can do well by doing well, which is the normal company. You can do good by doing well, the Rockefeller, Ford Foundation, the Bill Gates Foundation. You set up a philanthropy, you make a lot of money, then you said what, what uh, uh, Mr. Drucker was saying. And then you can also do good by doing good, which is the normal work of churches and voluntary organizations and so on. And then where I believe the future lies is to do well by doing good. In other words, your business model is about contributing to a better environment, a better society, and making money in the process. And that's basically what my companies do. 
uh, not yet as big a scale as I uh, aspire to and, and hope to get to, but we've proved that it works on the ground. And so here is the stairway to heaven for a, an entrepreneur. In the beginning, he or she starts out by PR, you know, for spin, to tell everybody how good you are, even if you're massacring the neighborhood. Um, then you get to compliance, do the things the law requires you to do, so you feel a little bit better about that, and you can tell people, I'm um, doing things within the law. And then you go beyond compliance, which is now getting seriously into something that gets close to what we call CSR. And then you get into philanthropy, and I believe the ultimate knock at the door, the, gale, you know, the pearly gates, is um, when you're a social enterprise, when you're actually in the marketplace doing things that are good for society. So you have private profit over there, and you get societal impact over there, and you gotta make some trade-offs. Normally people start over here, and as they get richer, they climb up that ladder. And in my humble opinion, I would call uh, the middle part uh, CSR, corporate social responsibility, and I would call the right-hand part beyond corporate social responsibility, the area that I think is the most interesting. If you are in the left part, you're going to be a footnote in history, maybe, maybe. If you're in the middle part, you'll be a chapter in a history book. But over here, they'll write history books about you. You're going to be big. So it depends on what your motivations are, but that's a nice area to be in. Oops. Sorry about that. There's some... Uh, has gone way off. Um, let me get back. All right. Um, now we're there. Machines have a life of their own, and they think in ways that I don't have any control over. Okay. Sorry about that. I don't know what's happened. Um, there's sort of a time delay built into this thing. All right. <laughs> All right. So people and profits. And I'm not going to try and go back. But uh, you can see that there are different kinds of capital that we need. Uh, venture capitalists are looking for business as usual. Uh, normal capital is still a lot more, but now beginning to do things for society and the environment. There is uh, different kinds of uh, socially responsible capital now, um, which is beginning to look at uh, interesting uh, possibilities. And then you, there is patient capital that gets feel-good uh, returns and is willing to uh, invest in things that don't necessarily pay as much as you get from a from a venture capitalist point of view. If we don't do this, we're going to end up by needing two additional worlds by the year 2030. If your uh, footprint is already 1.3, it's grown from 1.1 at the beginning of the century in the last eight years, you can expect basically roughly three times. And America is already at five, and, and Singapore probably at six, uh, and, or 6.5. Uh, and as I say, India's at 1.3 already, with 75% of the people not even in the economy. Can you imagine what's gonna happen when they uh, start having just sort of normal incomes? So sustainable development needs uh, a different approach. It needs not just to make money, it needs uh, more important to create jobs, home livelihoods, sustainable livelihoods, ones that don't destroy the environment in the process. So this brings me to the last part, which is about business of the future. And that business of the future is going to be one that is much more oriented towards creating those livelihoods. This is a picture that's kind of important symbolically. 
way at the back is a national university in India called Nehru University. Everything in India is called Nehru. You, you, you're familiar with the idea. Uh, Nehru or Gandhi in India, you got your own things. And we basically have a macho approach. This is, you know, the new India. Uh, concrete, steel, big stones. We're, uh, that's our u university in, in South Delhi. This is my headquarters, which is a stone's throw away from there. And it has no steel, no cement, no bricks, and no wood in it, and no air conditioning either. In a place like Delhi, that's quite remarkable. So this is a symbol of the kind of approach that we're now going to have a look at if we want to go into the future in the same kind of way. This is a uh, building that is made out of mud. It uh, actually now we've replaced it with a much bigger building. We recycled it into another one. But for 18 years, we had uh, 150 people working in there uh, with world-class productivity and you know, producing great creative products. Uh, the new one, which is, looks like this, is the model is just being finished, is a platinum rated, very, very highly ecological building. So it's a living kind of organism. And, uh, and there it is. Now, these pictures are about um, the technologies my organization developed. These roofing tiles, these roofs, are the cheapest roofs in India. But you can see they're attractive enough that they're used by middle class people. Um, and we developed all these technologies that I'm just going to go quickly through to demonstrate that it is possible for the third world, we're not necessarily talking about Singapore for a few minutes, uh, the third world to be able to solve its problems at very low cost by creating technologies that create jobs, that create purchasing power, that deliver goods and services that everybody locally needs. Now this doesn't mean that the global economy is wrong, it's simply that for some people you've got to first start with strengthening their local economy before they can participate in the global one. We took that piece of hill and within a year and a half we converted it into a forest. Uh, there are all kinds of uh, alternatives to oil and to biomass. And here is an example of a technology that uses wastes. This is a weed. This weed is called Ipomia. Came in from Costa Rica 150 years ago as a stowaway with some coffee shipment. It's taken over the country. In, in Hindi, it's called Besharam, which means shameless, because the more you cut it, the more it grows. And in fact, across the border, my friends in Pakistan tell me it's called politician, probably for the same reason. <laughs> uh, basically, it's impossible to get rid of. It, you can't burn it because it smells bad. Cattle won't eat it. You can't make it into furniture. You can't do anything with it. We converted it into a fuel, which goes into a gasifier, which we developed with India's top uh, technical university. And it gets that, that uh, gas gets fed into a diesel generator, and we sell electricity on a commercial basis cheaper than the grid, a lot cheaper than the grid, and make money. So it's possible to do different kinds of things, decentralized, smaller, local, community controlled, and generating a sense of ownership so that the people take care of their surroundings. Uh, this is a remarkable technology. My colleagues developed this over a period of six, seven years, supported by the Swiss government. Now we're selling large quantities, numbers of these, and it's getting carbon credits and everything else. It saves 50% of the energy to make a burnt brick. Uh, organic farming, uh, turn, using saline soils, saline water, salt water, uh, to grow new kinds of crops. Uh, transport systems, you know, we have airplanes, we have cars, we have, but everybody seems to have forgotten that the cheapest form of transport is an airship. Now, it may not make sense in Singapore, but in Africa, can you imagine what's going to happen if you make roads? I mean, the road is the ultimate sign, symbol of modernity. Everybody wants a road, but look what happens. You put a road in, you just devastate the countryside. You bring people into places they shouldn't be in to construct it, to, and after they construct it to use it, and destroy all the forests. You have massive soil erosion. Roads disrupt the hydrological cycle, so you have floods and drought and all the other stuff. So they have a lot of costs. 
And in order to build roads, you need materials. So you destroy the rivers. So there's a lot of problems with roads. And there's no reason why a big continent like uh, Africa or even India should have to have uh, other than major arterial roads because there are other ways to get around. And this is one of them. And it's a very good way. And its cost is one-tenth the cost of, um, of road transport, of trucks. So there are new ways that open up new possibilities for, um, for business. My last bit, because I'm now running out of time, is about what I call disruptive technologies. These are technologies that are going to be completely uh, disruptive of our past thinking, but they're the technologies of the future. Frankly, if I had some money, this is where I would put it right now, either as a businessman to make factories with these or as an investor. And they are based on nature. We call them the five kingdoms of nature. They use animals and plants and fungi and algae and bacteria to do the work that we do in big factories with high pressures, high temperatures, and everything else. And these technologies have been tested. They produce virtually no waste that isn't the raw material of something else. We know in nature there isn't anything left over, so they're very good at environmentally. And if they didn't work, they were recalled hundreds of millions of years ago. I mean, you know, they've been tested for four billion years. So why not use them? Let me give you examples. Uh, this is a project we have in Colombia, in the eastern part of Colombia, next to the Orinoco, next to Venezuela. Um, about 11, 12 years ago, we started with savanna. The savanna is so bad that only one person can survive in it for four square kilometers. And even that person has gastroenteric diseases, always sick. It's so bad that we bought the land for $1 a hectare. Pretty well give it to you free if you want it. And we converted it into a tropical rainforest in 11 years. A rich, almost virgin forest in 15. Now it's uh, getting there. And as a result, we get huge quantities of really pure drinking water, which can be sold at the same price as Avion in Paris and in Tokyo. So we make money out of that. We have a huge market, uh, carbon sink. We've got large amounts of biodiversity there. And we're producing significant amounts of biodiesel and a lot of other things like fruits and food and so on. Total investment, $1,000. Uh, one dollar for buying the, the hectare and one thousand dollars of investment in making it into a nursery and a, you know, planting and everything else. And 11 years later, the returns are about 300, 400 percent. Zero emissions, biomimicry. Mim biomimicry is the new science that we're going to all know more about very soon. How do we learn from nature? That's a termite hill. Now that termite hill inside no matter where it is, it can be the equator, it can be in the Arctic, any time of the year, that termite hill has a temperature inside which is roughly 24 degrees centigrade, plus or minus one. No air conditioner, no electricity, they manage to keep it steady throughout the year. They've got techniques to do that and we learn from them. So we use that to build this building in Harare, in Zimbabwe, called Eastgate. It's the most valuable real piece of real estate in in, in central southern Af Africa. It needs no air conditioning. You see those little turrets up there? Those are the termite sort of towers. And air just is forced to flow through it uh, to, by convection. And it keeps it cool. And then now we've started painting it up because we learned from the zebra how to go further in air conditioning. You know why they have the black and white stripes, of course. Uh, it's a natural air conditioning system. So. You can see those moths. They're enjoying the little cool air, you know, over the black part, because the black part has an extra half inch of fat underneath it, and the whole thing is set up to be basically. This is a plant called uh, Welwichia, Welwichia in the Namibian Desert, in southwest Africa, uh, which is capable of pulling water out of the air, enough of it to um, quench the thirst of the Hottentots who live there. 
This man is Jorge Reynolds. He was the inventor of the pacemaker 40 years ago. He's a Colombian, a bioengineer, and he spent the last 10 years studying the heart of the whale. And from it, he's learned how to make a pacemaker without intrusive surgery, without batteries. So now he's talking about very big time business uh, in, um, in controlling the heartbeat. This is a sand lizard in the Sahara. It can float through under, under the surface at a phenomenal speed because it has no friction. It's figured out how to go through sand with virtually zero friction. And from it, companies are now learning how to make better uh, frictionless uh, devices. Uh, we're producing a book called 100 Best Technologies of Nature, Nature's 100 Best. We actually have a catalog of 1,400 of them. But this book will be coming out in, uh, in Barcelona, we hope next week, in, in 10 days' time. And it will list the first 100 of those 1,400, which basically are like these. How do you learn from nature to get rid of halogens and bromines in fire retardants, which is something that was never been able to do before? Uh, people are now doing that. It has a huge impact on human health and everything else. How do you make um, a learn from nature to stop communication between bacteria? Because it's the communication between bacteria that multiply them, which then leads to either disease or corrosion or whatever else. And we've now got a company in Australia that is setting up uh, a biosignal company. It's called Biosignal Inc. or whatever uh, in, um, in Australia, which is uh, using this technique. Uh, how do you pull water out of, uh, out of the air? Uh, that well, which is one way. This, this beetle is another way. You see those pock marks on the beetle? Well, the, the high parts of those are positively charged, and the valleys are negatively charged, and they're designed in such a way that the water just coagulates and becomes uh, drops. And we've now got a little piece of architecture where we're developing a waterfall, just pulling water out of the air, and so on. This is a, uh, uh, a little uh, creature, whose name I've forgotten for a minute, uh, which has taught us how to make vaccines that don't need refrigeration. Can you imagine the impact of that? So we go on and on on buildings, on cars, on water, a lot of which. There's a thing called a pistol shrimp. And what the pistol shrimp does is it closes the mouth so fast that it produces a shock wave. And that shock wave purifies the water right next to it. And it's ultra pure water which then can be used for making integrated circuits and all kinds of other stuff. There are hundreds of these technologies. I've run out of time, and I want to thank you for being so patient with me. If you really want to make a difference, you've got to make a difference in your own lives as well. Thank you. Thanks very much for that. That was a fascinating talk. I'm sorry that we don't have a little more time. Uh, we do have time for questions, though. Um, I've been told by the tech people, since we're taping this, if you could go to one of the microphones and identify yourself and ask your questions, um, please. Hello. Uh, Ms. Uh, Dr. Costa, uh, organizers of this event, as well as uh, my fellow participants today, uh, a very warm hello. Um, just now I heard um, you talk about the uh, business of future. Okay, uh, I'm Mike from 9M Poly. Just now I heard you talk about the uh, business of future. I think it uh, gives us a lot of inspiration to think about them. And I have three questions to ask you. Firstly, um, I think from what you are talk about is that the future of business lies in the better realization of how to uh, protect our environment as, and thus working with the environment to achieve a better future. And how do you think we can persuade and also ask for more people to join us in this mission in order to develop our Earth at the same time preserve our environment? How do you think that we can you know, un unite the people from all works of life 
let them know that these changes we are, we are going to make is for the life for a lifetime instead of only you know impact them on their thoughts. Secondly, um, uh, I also just now heard that uh, there are various ways to try to you know uh, expand this business and make it really worldwide and covers a lot of areas. And how do you think that you know we can uh, find ways that specifically tailors to today's needs? For example, today we are you know facing some financial crisis. So how do you think that you know we can make these innovations, these technologies, uh, you know, connected with the world that we are living in today? And thirdly, uh, just now you you have talked about this, your company in India in India as well as the, you know, these trends, good trends in India. Would you also do us a favor by giving some, some of your insights on, you know, these technologies in uh, United States, uh, Singapore, as well as in China? Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> three questions. Um very, very good and incisive, all of them. Um, business operates in an environment that's defined by profits and competitiveness, basically. Being able to serve a particular market that they identify in some way that can generate uh, revenues that are more than the costs that they incur, and that they can stay ahead of their competitors in some way or other. And those are driving forces that I don't think we're going to be able to change very much. I think we've got to work with those as kind of given. The question really is what are the trade-offs and how much are they willing to do? Now, one of the problems that, that many of the issues that I, I showed you are a result of the fact that the prices that businesses face, that they pay, uh, are very distorted. They don't include the cost of pollution. They don't include the issues of, of uh, enormous uh, unemployment. They don't include the issues that we need to deal with. And if uh, by means like um, laws, taxes, incentives, and so on, uh, which take away the subsidies from bad things, you know, we did a study of perverse subsidies, subsidies that actually lead to both losses, as well as environmental damage, and they're two trillion dollars worth in the world today, in just four sectors, in energy, water, agriculture, and transport, but two trillion dollars worth of subsidies being paid by different governments and by, you know, various agencies to do the wrong thing. Now, if you just took those away, you would have a chance to be able to compete. And that's why wind and solar and biomass and all these other things don't work, because the cost of real cost of fossil fuels has been totally um, distorted, because it doesn't include the costs of extraction, of environmental damage, of depletion, or what it's going to do to future generations. None of those costs are there. So unless you have mechanisms, and many of them will have to be government mechanisms, for either putting in taxes or fiscal incentives or whatever to bring about signals in the marketplace that are indicative of what we want to do with, with a better world, you won't be able to get that. So there is a role for government through fiscal incentives to do this. A second way is for companies to apply peer pressure on each other to be able to make sure that uh, they are all more or less, you know, not going to now, it's not about cartels, but that they won't lose by doing the right thing. I'm on the jury of, of many um, environmental prizes, and some of them are prizes given to big corporations, companies or leaders of companies, entrepreneurs who've done something good for the environment. And about two years ago, we gave a prize to an Italian gentleman, the head of one of the largest uh, electronics industries, in, the largest electronics industry in Italy. And he got the price because from being a nasty, highly polluting, bad businessman 10 years back, he'd become an exemplary, uh, environmentally conscious, sensitive uh, CEO, chairman uh, of the board. And we asked him when we were giving him the price, how did it happen? 
And he said, well, I couldn't face my daughter at the breakfast table every day when she was telling me the school children at school were making, you know, um, fun of her because her father was a bad um, citizen. And, and I couldn't go on like that, subjecting my daughter to that kind of uh, uh, abuse. So, you know, there are different ways in which it's going to happen. Uh, it seems to me that that last one of using the next generation, which is now more and more conscious of these things, to be the promoters of a better behavior is not bad. There's nothing wrong with that. It could have been the son, too. I mean, it's not a sexist remark, you know. I mean, it could have been anybody. Yeah. Uh, but it's, uh, the point is that um, we need to use governments, uh, peer pressure from corporations, uh, and indeed um, uh, family pressure and societal pressure. I mean, it's pretty hard to go to a cocktail party when everybody's looking at you as a bad guy, you know? You can't do it too often. So those are the kinds of things on your first question. Second one, in days of financial crisis, you know, financial crisis is not a given. It didn't have to happen. All of you think that the financial crisis is about uh, subprime loans, I'm sure, but it's not. I mean, subprime loans just triggered the final thing. Even if there had been no subprime loans, the price of oil was already at 100 and whatever, 50, and now, you know, it's going to stay up at a totally different level than it's ever been. The price of water, the price of food, nothing to do with subprime loans. We've had explosive happenings and they have to do a lot with the issues I'm talking about because they're largely rooted in massive abuse of the environment. So, in a sense, your question has to be unasked. It's the other way around. It's, the, it's not at a time of financial crisis that we have to forget about these inessential things about the environment. It's now that we have to do the most because that's what's an indicator of the kind of things that are going to happen if we don't. So we better pull up our socks and say, look, we, we can't hide behind lack of finance because the more you do of this, the worse it's going to get. The medicine is actually causing the problem if you forget about the environment right now. So we're going to have to get across the message, like I was trying to do at Bloomberg this morning, that that's the wrong question. I mean, we've really got a problem because there is a major league disjoint, um, a breakdown uh, between economics and the, and the ecosystem, and you, you can only lose. I mean, you know, nature's been here a lot longer than us. And on the third one, what do we do? You know, you know my insights from development alternatives are appropriate for a third world country, okay? Now, this is not a third world country. Uh, I don't go around the world trying to suggest people in in California or in Japan or in Singapore um, uh, do what we're trying to do, which is to go from here to here, and you're already up there. But the root causes, the uh, overall, what would you say, principles behind those solutions are applicable to all of us, not the actual making of mud blocks. I mean, I don't expect you to make a mud building, but it's very appropriate for some of the circumstances where I'm working but I do expect you to learn that reducing energy use, reducing um, water use, reducing material use is crucial, and recycling. And all. So, so the lessons that we have to offer are to do with principles and the meta-level uh, lessons that we learn. But the actual technologies, I sell lots of them in Burkina Faso and in Nigeria and lots of places around Southeast Asia, but, you know, I don't think anybody's going to buy my mud block presses in, in Singapore. So I don't, you know, I'm not trying to, to sell anything here. All I'm saying is that it's in your interest in this country to bring down your ecological footprint from wherever it is, and I believe it's somewhere around six, six and a half, to somewhere where you can live with it. Otherwise, you can get going to get screwed because the prices of what you're buying are going to go, keep on going up. And whether it's water or energy or um, materials, you've got to get off this addiction. You know, it's, it's hard. So that's all I can say about the insights I get from mine. I've shared them with you. In Thank fact, you very much. Thank you. Do we have another question just up there, then one just there? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. 
Dr. Ashok Kosla. Yeah. Uh, my question is this. The destruction, in my view, the destruction of the environment can be boiled down to the abdication of responsibility on the part of the entrepreneurs who are out to exploit nature for the maximization of profit. That if we are to depend on the conscience of the developers, we are going to end up in collective suicide, as you suggested. Now, as I, my question is, uh, what has the United, Nation, United Nations Environment Program been doing up to this point in time in trying to turn back the tide of destruction? Thank you. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, I, I think like that, what he said. Um, people ought to be more responsible. Sure. It's a fact. But on Tuesdays and Thursdays, and maybe even Saturdays, I, I figure they're not going to do it, so let's find ways to persuade them in their own self-interest that they have to do it. It's no use telling people to be good. It is. I mean, that's what religions are all about. And there's still people going around murdering each other and stealing from each other and telling lies and doing all the things that they're not supposed to do. It seems to me that we've got to, as I was saying earlier, figure out ways in which places like this school train people to think about the bigger issues and internalize them as their value systems which includes being responsible, but it includes defining what is my bigger interest to include a healthy environment because that's my only source of real survival. So I think we've got to figure out more uh, intellectually acceptable ways of persuading people. And I'm not sure it's enough to tell them to be more responsible, but we've got to do that as well. Um, you know, the United Nations, all of it, not just the environment program, which I, I think is a great place, and I spent five years of my life there, um, has been consciously, on purpose, set up by governments to be toothless. They don't want to be told by the United Nations what to do. It is designed to be ineffective. It so happens that once in a while, by fluke, some of these things happen. But by and large, you can't expect a system that has been designed not to work on purpose to work. But um, having said that, they've had enormous successes. They managed to stop the manufacture and sale of CFCs uh, for the, uh, to protect the ozone layer. They have brought the climate change issue right up to the top, the number one agenda in the world over and about virtually everything else except in Mr. Bush's eyes where it's, you know, something else. Uh, they've managed to uh, almost bring biodiversity issues, species extinction and so on, and will do in the next two years, right to the next number two slot. So it's not that they haven't done their bit on that. It's hard for them to set a framework of thinking for business. They weren't designed to deal with the issues of business. And we've got other forums that we've uh, been dealing with. Uh, um, Camilla took me to meet some corporates yesterday, and they're part of a climate change consortium. Then there's the World Business Council for Sustainable Development. These are um, consortiums and associations of big businesses, sometimes big and small businesses, that are more influential to some extent than governments are allowed to be by businesses. So we have to find different ways, and ultimately it's the watchdogs. Ultimately it's two people, three, three people, three sectors. One is the NGOs, the civil society, which have to keep blowing the whistle and saying it's not good enough. The second is the media, which have to play their role and they're not playing it. Most of them are controlled by the interests that are actually are causing the problem, so you know they don't necessarily play the right role. And the third is 
the academic uh, institutions that bring up the next generation of business people, like the school. And they have to uh, be um, trained to think about these things. And I think that's where the future lies. It's going to take time. It's not something that you can, you can achieve overnight. I mean, it's not going to happen. So let's not be too patient because we don't have that much time. But we've got to accelerate the process by which, and that's why, you know, I, um, I, I, I did have other things to do, but when I get a chance to come and talk to future business leaders, that's very important for me. That's why I'm here. I think we've got to share these ideas and, and these kinds of perceptions uh, more and more. And, you know, I don't know how many of you agree with everything I said, but I don't think we can really ignore them entirely either. And we're going to have to, to change our ways. Thank you. Hello, my name is May Lee. Um, I have a question regarding um, a pol political role. Sorry, I'm too short for this. Okay, I think you can hear me. Um, question about political role in um, trying to create change. Obviously, there's social awareness that's growing about these existing problems in the world, but, you know, arguably politics has to play a role in this as well with policy. Um, unfortunately, right now in the United States, we have uh, some candidates, especially one vice presidential candidate who shall remain nameless. But she has said uh, that she doesn't actually believe that humans are the cause of global warming. She also rejected the idea of putting polar bears uh, on the endangered species list, and so on and so on. I use that as an example because here we have a future, possibly a future leader saying these things and influencing society to possibly feel the same way. So first of all, I would love to get your reaction to what she said. Uh, but secondly, you know, do you see there, that there is a stronger political will around the world in terms of combating these problems? Uh, the answer to your first question, I think, is embedded in everything I've been saying for the last hour and a half. So there's no point in my making explicit something that you all know what I feel. Um, polar bears are an indicator of the health of the Arctic. I mean, if polar bears go, we've got a problem. Uh, and uh, they have a right to live anyway, even if they were not useful as indicators of the health of the ecosystem, there's no way that I could be found to agree with whoever this politician is. Um, on your um, second point, I have to go back to the previous answer. Uh, political will doesn't come from um, politicians. Political will comes from their perception of what will get them votes. And political will comes from the demand by the voters, the public, the uh, public at large, uh, for better behavior. If politicians thought that they'd get more votes because they're environmentally sound, uh, their policies are um, wise, uh, they would be wise. Here's a, an ultimate example of that is uh, Arnie Schwarzenegger. You know, I mean, he was no different from whoever you were talking about uh, only a few years ago, but when he got there, he realized that that's where the votes were. And there is no politician in the U.S. who's been more active, proactive on the environment, on renewable energy, on this and that, than Schwarzenegger, because he knows which side his bread is buttered. This is what I got to do to get reelected. He's not an environmentalist. He is expressing political will because he knows that's where the votes are. To get those votes are the three actors that I was talking about. Basically, the NGOs, the civil society, which are, by their nature, a nuisance value, because, I mean, no matter what, they, what the establishment does, they're against it. So that's easy. Uh, the media have to play a much stronger role, and they're not able to do that because of nature of ownership and, and everything else. And the institutions of uh, training future business leaders. Uh, and, of course, generally, education institutions as a whole. So I think political will is a misnomer. I don't know what it means other than that the public is really making a demand, is aware enough 
and able to make a demand enough for political change. Politicians like Mahatma Gandhi don't exist. There are very few of them. Al Gore, God bless his soul, claims that you know he ha had a problem with his re-election partly because you know he was on the environment. I'm not sure that's entirely correct. He got a lot of votes because he was an environmentalist too. Um, I think we've got to recognize that um, it's our job. It's not our political. We choose the political leaders. If they don't have political will, why don't we choose somebody else? You know. So it is. I mean, that may not be possible in every country. So I'm not going to insist uh, to this audience uh, what it is. But but in many societies, it is. So. Um, I'm watching my step. <laughs> Dr. Sok, um, an honor to have you back to Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy. Uh, Michael Ma from Inishin. I've been um, an environmentalist since I was like 10 and I didn't even know it. Um, it started off with fish, whales, dolphins. And then I came across Dr. Sok Kosler at Wild University being an economist and being greeny, I was uh, at odds with myself, not knowing, as an economist, I'm supposed to do maximum production, you know, profit, green, and then being a greeny, being a fish lover, how do I do that? And it's all about what you're saying, you know, being small, then being an economist is about maximum production. I was at then I came across Dr. Sok uh, policies while being an ISEC president at the UN. Then it changed my ways of thinking. Then I only came across this guy again about two, three years ago. Then I realized who shaped my policies in my mind. And I would say I was at ease leaving uh, finishing economics because that's the only course I could do because I wasn't smart enough to be a doctor, lawyers, or anything else. And then I realized school is a very important thing. What you said earlier, and I think we alluded to uh, the previous opinion leaders and how Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy could do. In my opinion, you guys are the influence of um, the future. People respect this school. And I think if you come out with some point scoring system for, you know, all the IPO stuff on the, on the uh, Singapore Stock Exchange and have like, you know, you've got to spend half a percent of your gross turnover on a green point system and Lee Kuan Yew School Public Policy will give you a star, two star, three star ranking of how green you are. Um, you know, and that's a very easy thing to do because I think in this forum, by talking about it, I don't think it's going to get anywhere. So can I just have a hands on who's from Legal News School of Public Policies here? <laughs> Nobody. Nobody. Oh, we've got one, two, three, four, and we five, and then we've got an ambassador from Austria. <laughs> so how do we do that? See, how does Legal News School of Public Policy, since we're here, convert this conversation through the market and lead it to, let's say, you know, and I think this is a very, you guys cry a little bit and you get a hundred million bucks from rich businessmen, you know? I mean, I mean, I never seen anything like it, yeah? So why don't League One Youth School Public Policy come up with such policies to start making where the bottom, where the bucks hurt right in the back of the pocket for corporates and to be corporate social responsibility, they, whereby they can support such, halogen, uh, such foundations like halogen foundations where Melissa is sitting there, Melissa Gui, chairwoman, who's uh, making future leaders. And I've been to her foundation and it's an amazing. All the young kids knew about your water bottles, everything that you min mentioned, and I've, I've, I've learned a lot of new things today, even though I knew most of the stuff you told me about already, but I've learned a lot of things today. So can I just um, get um, Professor Darrell and um, maybe Colonel Chopin to tell us about what legal new school policy would do? 
They just said I'd get a bottle of wine if I hosted this, so I've got <laughs> no idea. But the vice dean is sitting over there, and I'm just about to be fired. But it's actually a very interesting question, and I know, I know Stavros and Chopra will want to take it up. I just work here. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Daryl. <laughs> and I'll expect the uh, bottle of wine to, <laughs> to come to my office. Um, well, let me, let me just start by saying uh, uh, thank you to, uh, to Michael and uh, Camilla for, uh, again, making it possible for uh, Dr. Kostler to be here and, uh, and give us this talk. Um, I just want to make one, uh, one uh, minor qualification. That is, we have discontinued the bottles. We're clearing the stock. <laughs> but we're no longer we're no longer buying uh, bottled water. I'm happy to. <laughs> right. um, I'm going to you know I think the the issue of whether we should uh, you know launch a um, a point system um, is an interesting one. I think it's uh, it's something that uh, our faculty will uh, need to sort of be engaged on and, and express an interest in actually doing as a scholarly exercise. Uh, but I think we do take environmental issues uh, very, very um, seriously. Uh, you may have read in the press that we've uh, just recruited uh, somebody who's, uh, who's been active in, uh, in the environmental uh, movement in India, uh, uh, Dr. Srikant Gupta, uh, to essentially lead um, our research and uh, teaching uh, in this area. Uh, we also have environmental economists on the faculty so at least in the area of, of uh, training and education of uh, future policymakers, uh, we are active. But I'll take on board the suggestion and, uh, and sort of table it for a discussion uh, amongst faculty and see whether uh, that's something that uh, uh, they'd be interested in doing. And perhaps, uh, you know, it could be uh, sponsored by Indochine. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Uh, certainly, you could use the venue to start it up. It's a good place. It's um, the birthplace of many good ideas. We're uh, fast coming to uh, the end. Just one more question? Sure, by all means. I'm Kirtida, a Singaporean but originally from India. I do quite a lot of work in India, especially for malnutrition and tree planting here and in India. But knowing so much about development alternatives, if you can give me two projects that I can put my money where it is, or I walk my talk and talk my walk, could you give me two projects that you think are worth uh, uh, working towards? Sure. I'm all, that's, that's my business. Can I do it right now? I didn't come here to market my stuff. My favorite project, uh, this is going to take a couple of minutes. Uh, if somebody has to go, they should just leave, I guess, because now we're into, into real commercial activity. Uh, <clears throat> my, my, my favorite project is a very dramatic, almost miracle program that was developed by an Englishman who walked into my office about five years ago and said, you know, I've done everything I want to do in life, and now I want to work with you and help in any way I can. His name was Victor Lyons, and he'd been through all kinds of things. He was a world-class photographer. He was a psychological, what do you call it, sort of, not nurse, but um, a para, para doctor, uh, practitioner. And he had set up the first, world's first trauma clinic in London for people who had lost their children, had lost a child, which is really the ultimate trauma. And, you know, they... He, he worked on ways in which and this clinic was replicated in many places in England and in Israel and in Florida and places. So he was a quite successful guy. And he was also an incredibly talented um, coder, um, programmer, you know, software developer. So he had many facets and he said, I can do anything and I'd like to donate my time to development alternatives. So he did. And he moved to India and started living more or less like an Indian which is quite a feat for an Englishman, and he wanted to learn Hindi, and uh, he couldn't. It was tough. So he devised a program using morphing technology, 
graphic technology, which is so dramatic that it can teach a total illiterate how to read and write, how to read a newspaper, 15 words a minute, how to write a poem in 30 days. 100 minutes a day, 30 days, and this person will never forget how to read and write because it's very, uh, it uses nine memory hooks and all kinds of techniques and so on. Now, this uh, program, which is called Tara, which is our company name, Akshar, which means in Hindi, um, uh, word, uh, has become uh, quite extraordinarily successful. I got the British government to give us a million dollars, half a million pounds, and with it, in seven months, uh, we set up a, a, an army-like, um, you know, force to deliver all over the countryside in seven states of India, put a colonel, a retired colonel in charge, and told him this is, you know, this is the enemy, go out and get him. <laughs> and we gave him a cell phone, and we gave him, from that money from the British, 56 or whatever laptops, and he went out there, trained people, and in seven months we had tra uh, taught over 50,000 women for this amount of money, which is, uh, you know, just a phenomenally successful, low-cost, highly efficient mechanism. Any amount of money, you see, the, the, this is the one product in my organization, one of the very few, that actually cannot be profitable from the end client paying for it. Normally, almost everything we do, making bricks, making water, making, this, this is from my hand looms, whatever, actually makes more money than it costs. So we, we make a profit of some kind, maybe 5%, 10%. When we make a rupee profit, we go laughing all the way to the bank. It's impossible to get money out of an economy in which everybody's earning 20, half a dollar a, uh, a day, you know? So it's quite a feat to do a social enterprise in a poor country. And we've done it. We've proved that it works. But this one is a project that can only be done on the basis of a fair amount of subsidy. We do insist on the woman paying something, but it's a tiny amount compared with what uh, it costs. It costs us $60 per person. So we've got, uh, every time somebody gives us 60, we can train one woman. If they give us 600, we can take 10. And if you're willing to give me half a million, I'll train, you know, whatever. So um, depending on what we do, we modularize it, and we just put people to work. This is uh, where it's very easy we can give you we have websites, we can give you photographs of the women, they will write you a nice letter saying, thank you for supporting it, now I can write. So all that's possible. That's my favorite. The second favorite, where the impacts on the economy are just really phenomenal, uh, like, you know, like three, four hundred percent a year. I mean, we're talking about um, an economics which is very different from the conventional economics is the check dams. So if you were to put money into a check dam, $8,000 uh, 8, Singapore dollars, 9,000 Singapore dollars, you would change the lives of about 20,000, well, 15,000 people maybe, who will go from, say, one crop or zero crops to th two crops, maybe three crops. Uh, they will have fish, they'll have recreation, they'll have water in their wells, they'll have such a dramatic impact on their lives that uh, the economy and the quality of life is completely different within 15 months. So that is a very high return uh, thing. And that money stays in that economy, helps them do more things, build schools, uh, send their children to college, whatever. So uh, those are the two that I think have the highest potential impact. I've got lots and lots of others, which are also very, very sexy, but these two are a good start. Great, thank you. And given the time, I know we could probably go on for many hours more. It's been an absolutely fascinating conversation. I might be coming on Monday to you for a job if my vice dean is still mad at me for dobbing in. Um, but thank you very much for the conversation today. It's been tremendous having you here. We hope you'll come back again and spend some time at the school. Please join me in thanking our guests.